breakfast puppies? This podcast contains adult language and content and is meant for mature audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Have you heard? The Glitter Boys are the hot new thing. They're hip. Today on Miss Manners. <laughs> Today on Ask NPC. <laughs> Yeah, we have some listener email to respond to here. This one came in from Douglas via Facebook. Uh, Douglas has messaged us a few times with some excellent questions. This one I felt was really good and worth turning into a complete episode all on its own. Matthew, you want to read it aloud? Yeah, sure. Doug here again. Love the show, but I need your insights. Have to ask, how do you handle adventure prep? I am the longstanding GM of my group, but... How do you handle these situations? Character creation is so time-consuming to flesh out every NPC and villain's encounter. Help me. I've been faking it up till now and creating mobs on the fly, but I am looking to see if there's a better way. And maybe a little bit less time-consuming. I just spent six hours perfecting a vampire hunter for an NPC anti-hero. Help me, please. Well, Doug... Never fear. I am here to offer you some completely off the cuff bullshit responses, which will not help you in any way, shape or form, but will sound good on the podcast. NPC, on the other hand, might have some actual ways to help you. I don't know if I could follow that, dude. I think you should go right. Go right ahead. Take it. Okay, cool. So here's here's what I do. I I do this two ways when I'm running a game and I, I, I should... I should put this forward that I have never run a Rifts game. I, I have played in Rifts, but I, I've never run a Palladium game beyond like junior high school. We're making this up. We have one D6 from backgammon. I mean, kind of way to play. Mm-hmm. So I either pathetically optimize everything by taking days and days and days to craft the 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 perfect scenario fleshed out in in every detail. Just every possible, every, every possible permutation of, of this encounter will have uh, stats, likely encounters, where they're going to go, what they're thinking, what their motivations are, full names, family histories. I could go that route, and I have. But I also am a big fan of this is off the cuff and just this is what he does. I'm going to flip to the, uh, in this case, uh, looks like OCC. And give a quick glance at uh, what their what their character does, what their what their powers are, and what their their likely ability to absorb damage is, and go from there. Honestly, I, I'd say about three quarters of the time, I I fill out a three by five card of this is what I have, and you know some some pertinent facts, and that's that. I do even less. <laughs> 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 okay, so to answer your question, Douglas, you you ask, you know, uh, you've been faking it up to now. How do you handle adventure prep? How do you stat out these characters? What's the easiest way to do it? How do you? And my answer is, I don't. That's the short version. The long version is, adventure prep for me is my least favorite thing, unless... I've got a really juicy idea that I just can't wait to get down. In those cases, adventure prep for me becomes its own, you know, moment of joy that my ADHD brain can hyper focus on. And suddenly I've written a novel length background about something happening. And then I realize, why am I writing this? The fact that I've written all of this down practically guarantees that it will never come up and play because the players will never bother going in that direction. And then I'm like, okay, I'm wasting my time. So I think, all right, what I need, I need factions. I need just to name some factions, a short goal of what each faction wants, a short description of where that faction is, a list of two to five names that I want to have in that faction, or it could be names it, for me, it's names. I usually start with a name, but oftentimes it could also simply be a position, a role, uh, something, some purpose of a character in this faction. And again, that's an index card right there. One faction, basic mm-hmm. notes. I do the same with some locations. I get, this is going to be a cool place to have a fight. So I write down, you know, bald mountain, and then I think, dot, 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 
on fire and great. There we have, there we have a scenario <laughs> for something to happen. Now, maybe that's a battle or maybe that's a plot thread. Who knows? Why is Bald Mountain on fire? Let's go investigate. Or, oh no, we're fighting at Bald Mountain and suddenly it's on fire. Crap. <laughs> it's just, then with NPCs, I sit and think, who do I want in this? Why do I want them to be there? What's their motive? You know, I, I was an actor. I was into uh, stage acting and radio acting for a while. And one of the things that you go into very early on in elementary acting classes is what's my motivation? Why am I here? So for every NPC, I, you know, I get either a name and or role and position. I get their motivation, why they're even here in the first place. And if the only reason is because I think that they should be there because that's the way it is, then I have to rethink if I'm even going to put that NPC in the scene in the first place. For numbers, I generally don't stat out anything unless I immediately think that number is important. This guy has 1,000 mega damage. Why? Because I think he should have 1,000 mega damage. Can I justify him having 1,000 mega damage? Well, it's time to do that. So right. then I go through a book and say, oh, okay, I'll give him this piece of armor. Problem solved. There should be a, a differentiation between like, this is the main villain and this is Barmook number 16. Like, nobody's going to bother with Barmook number 16. He doesn't need a name. He doesn't need a backstory. But if this is going to be a recurring villain, feel free to roll a character on him is, is the way I usually look at it. I think that there might actually be some text in one of the books somewhere. And if there's not, there needs to be that says these numbers only apply to the players. Because so many of the NPCs that you see in every Palladium game ever were clearly not made with the character creation rules. Mm -hmm. So many of them were, were put there because Kevin or whoever was writing thought it would be cool to make a combination of that name, that background, and that set of numbers on a sheet of paper. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do like to have the reoccurring statted out, though. I, I, I want more than just the base on it. Like, if, if this is the uh, Snively Whiplash and the, uh, the Mustache Twist, mm -hmm. uh, if, if this is the foil, the, the, the main nemesis, then I'm, I, want, I want detail, which generally means he'll be killed 1.5 uh, uh, minutes <laughs> into the encounter. Because somebody dropped a train on him or something ridiculous. But yeah, I like to take time with my villains. Because of the fact that people will do that and you have no guarantee that your villain will make it more than a few minutes into your first scene. Because of that, I've gotten to where if I want someone to, if I think someone's going to be important and recurring, then I'll get some basic facts about them. And, you know, I still won't stat them out completely yet. What I'll do is I'll put mm. down what I think that their chances of uh, having a skill are like, oh, OK, if this is Snidely Whiplash, I might not know his full array of skills right now, but I definitely know he has taunting at 89 percent or something like that. And, mm. you know, uh, this guy, for whatever reason, I think he's also a sniper. So that tells me that when I roll to hit someone, I'm just going to arbitrarily give him a plus 10 to that shot. Just write it down, bam, plus 10, and then I'll come back to it later in play. I'll, I'll bring that out in play, and then I will come back to it later after a session. Did he survive the session? Is he interesting enough the way I portrayed him to now recur? All right, now let's stat him out. Mm -hmm. And you know what? If by some chance that when I do stat him out, the numbers don't align to what I originally had, who fucking cares? Players probably don't yeah. know that because they don't let them see the sheet anyway. So, you know, I was thinking of another way too. There was, what was it called? Um, and I'm not sure that anyone's ever done this for rifts because it's just too big. But uh, Path Guy. Uh, Path Guy is a, uh, a roller and it was for all kinds of, for D and D and a whole bunch of associated games, and uh, basically it was just it was a real simple drop down menu for D and D rolling because it was a character generator. Can you spell that? P a t h g u y. It was a uh, JavaScript. And let's see, was it just uh. this now? It was Pathfinder. Yeah, it is just D and D. Damn it. Oh. Uh, hmm. Yeah, but I used to use the hell out of this um, because you could just roll the dice and then 
assign the scores. And it was just this beautiful, simple <laughs> JavaScript drop down. Yeah, I will have to look at that. I am recording from a rem- from a different location normally, and my internet connection. Well, okay, it's not terrible. It's just not the one that I have at mm. home, which is a gigabit. <laughs> And the delay yeah. here, I've just decided I'm not going to open anything on the internet for the duration Fair. of this call. If we're running right now. <laughs> yeah. My advice would be to do what I'm about to do and say, uh, let's see, uh, Riff's character. Riff's character generator. Well, there are a few different options for that. Are there any good ones? They have... Their official one, which I think is an Excel sheet. Um, There are some Mm -hmm. people who I have it on good authority are developing their own uh, internally, like a fan character sheet generator, which Mm -hmm. so far, from my understanding, they're looking pretty good. I think the biggest hurdle that they might face is if they put it out and Palladium is, you know, friendly to the idea of another character generator beating out there. Yeah. It's hard um, because there there doesn't seem to be one. Damn. So that was terrible advice. Uh, Well, (laughs) Rift's automated character sheet by Palladium Books. Let's see what they got here. Oh, thanks, AVG. I really don't care. There's one that costs six bucks, apparently. Mm -hmm. You can get it on drive-thru. I think you can even get Uh, it from their website. Yeah. Well, so speaking of spreadsheets, for my previous games that I ran with you and the others... I went through and created a basic spreadsheet that built a character out across 15 levels. And, Mm -hmm. but it was, well, seven or eight levels, really, because I went on odd numbers. So level one, level three, level five, et cetera. What it based on was uh, the first page of the sheet had just the basic role layout of MOOC. A, you know, generic MOOC right. coalition grunt or dog pack soldier. And then each additional page built off of that. So it had the foundation on page one and then page three, uh, or level three, it would add a few numbers. Level five, it would add a few more numbers and so on and so on. I like it. Yeah. So it was easy enough for me to then pull that out and play and just hit the tab of what level that character was and get a quick visual dump of the numbers that I need and only the numbers that I needed. Like, you know, I don't really need to know the coalition soldiers climb skill percentage. I'm just never as a GM going to roll that either the soldier's going to successfully climb that wall or they're not. It's not exciting. If I roll that, all that's really exciting Mm -hmm. to the players is the numbers that affect them. (laughs) Like, can this guy shoot me and can he survive if I shoot him? Well, let's actually take a step back from the actual physics of it and discuss uh, the mouth taste of the, of the the thing, so to speak. So Doug, if I'm understanding your question, you you're just, you're trying to figure out a way to speed this process up. And as the long running GM, that's a, that's a valid freaking question. Because, you know, life, you, you, there is more to life than, than rolling dice. I know that's a heretical thing to say, but it's true. <laughs> so here's the thing. In a heroic encounter, and I'm assuming that you're of a good a heroic alignment because that's what I always assume because that's what I enjoy playing. You're going to want a significant level of conflict, which means rolling doesn't really enter into it unless you feel that it needs to. Your your character should be challenged. They they should be hurt. And let's just call it a base combat and not like an information gathering or a riddling the Sphinx. You know, just this is just you punch me, I punch you. They should feel success if they overcome it or fear if they don't. So what I do, and please don't get mad at me, internet, is I adjust on the fly. I never take it to a point of like zerging the party into submission pulp, but I, I do... I, I will I will pump something that's not prepped for it harder than it needs to be just to add drama to the scenario. And I feel that that's a good a good way to involve people to make them feel present instead of just looking at their numbers going, okay, how do I min max this in order to hit this guy harder than anyone else so I can pat myself on the back? You mm-hmm. want them to feel a connection. You want them to feel anxiety over this. And yeah, I man, I think just do it on the fly. You know, if, if you roll and it doesn't, yeah, well, f- screw it. You hit him. <laughs> you know? Yeah. 
Seriously, I know it sounds cheesy. I know it sounds totally <laughs> railroady, I guess is the word that the kids are using now. But the 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 enemies will have the numbers that you want them to have when they when they need to have them. And even if you even even when I spend hours putting together an NPC in advance, when that NPC hits the table, I try to keep things moving so fast that I frequently forget to even look at the guy's character sheet. And when I roll mm-hmm. the dice, I just make a number up anyway. Yeah. Or he might not end up having been built the way that I thought he should have. And then suddenly I'm like, a mental adjustment. I'm going to give him another plus five to strike, but I think his dodge is too high. So I'm going to drop that a little bit here. And it just, and then I realize yeah. why did I even give him stats in the first place? <laughs> Yeah. So here's the thing, though. It's what you just said. But just keep in mind that this isn't a way to railroad people. This isn't a way to to badger your party into submission and doing what you want. This unless it's the goal is to be repeatable. And he always drops out of a secret escape hatch going. Meh. <laughs> yeah, he, this is something that should be dealt with. Uh, the the bringing of drama and intensity should never be. Uh, a total party kill you know <laughs> it it should never be any anything to the point where it you're you're taking the agency from your players and putting it into your hands for your own reasons it should be to aid them in their story agreed 1000 percent. like if you are juking the numbers on the fly in order to kill the party well Yeah, that's probably bad. Unless, of course, that was something that you had established at the beginning of the campaign. But normally you'd have to be like, you want to juke the numbers to challenge them, but don't do it maliciously. I I think here we go. Matthew's rule number 6,321. If you're doing it for their benefit, it's good. If you're doing it for your benefit, it's not. That's that's my rule on fudging dice. If you're doing it for their benefit, totally legit. If you're doing it for your own, you know. No, you're you're being a dick. There are some games where I am hardcore vehemently against fudging the dice for any reason whatsoever. Yeah, Warhammer. Rifts and Palladium are not one of those games with Rift because there's so many modifiers. There's so many roles. And oftentimes as a game master, you just can't keep it all in your head. That means yeah. you, know, you roll a die and you wing it it's fudging the dice again i play a lot of old school renaissance games osr and with them oftentimes it's the dice lay where they fall but something with rifts when you're rolling so many dice sometimes you just you gotta fudge it just makes the action feel more comic book anime that rifts is supposed to be you know why there's no path guy there's no path guy for rifts. There's no generator for rifts because you can't because it's too fucking big because it's too fucking <laughs> monolithic. Like it's, it's been going since the, the 80s, the same rule set, and they keep adding to it. You can't yeah. go, OK, well, you rolled this amount and this is what you qualify for because there's still new product coming out. There's a mountain of product coming out. And it's what you just said. You, you, you can't you can't carry it unless you were uh, some sort of savant that is eerily specialized in rifts, which sadly, I don't believe either of us are. So, Douglas. So, Doug, uh, long story short. Yeah. (laughs) Go ahead, please. So, yeah, Douglas, I would say that my advice to you would be to look at the way that you have been doing things so far and don't be ashamed of it. Realize that, as the Mandalorian says, this is the way. (laughs) (laughs) And you came by it organically. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely nothing to be ashamed of. If nothing else, you have clued into it early and you're the the better advice that i would give is instead of trying to do things differently just take what you're already doing and find a way to refine it try to way mm. to instead of that vampire hunter you don't have to stat him out intensely but you know look at the character class that you want him to have hand pick a number of skills and you're like he's definitely going to have that and he's definitely going to have that that's what i care about give him those numbers and let the rest just sort of fall into the background yeah like what i do is i just stick a a sticky note on the page for vampire hunter and when the party feels kicked around enough if he's that kind of villain that's when he either dies or runs off Mm -hmm. and i'm just going off of oh what what can he do he can do this okay yeah that's it 
That's literally it. And that, in my opinion, for the way I run things, that's all I need. But I'm also yeah. a very improvisational game master. Now, I, I will say, uh, as a little caveat for those of you who are listening to the show and don't play riffs, this is very riff specific advice. There are systems that are way easier. There are systems that have uh, a lot of tools built around it that, you know, like, like Path Guy for D&D, very easy. It just, you know, it literally takes five minutes to give you a fully fleshed character, and that's fine. Warhammer does not have the room for all this flummery. No, it's a very exacting thing. There, there, are, there are places where this advice fits, and there's places where it doesn't. I would say this fits very well with uh, the Palladium system, the Rifts especially. Don't do this everywhere. <laughs> this is not good advice for everywhere. At least I don't, I don't feel it is. All right. All right. Well, hopefully this helped you, Doug. Keep doing what you're doing because you're doing well and you're doing fine. (laughs) (laughs) Glad we could help. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for listening, folks. You've been listening to The Glitter Boys, a Palladium Books fan podcast. Glitter Boys, Rifts, the Megaverse, and all other such topics are the property of Kevin Sambita and Palladium Books. Please buy all their stuff and help keep them in print and making more games. You can order directly at palladiumbooks.com, and their entire catalog is available digitally at DriveThruRPG as well. Our opening music is 8-Bit Bass and Lead by Furby Guy from freesound.org. This closing music is Caravana by Philip Gross, available at freemusicarchive.org. All sound effects used are self-made or acquired via Creative Commons Zero License. If you like what you have heard, find us on Twitter and Facebook as The Glitter Boys. That's B-O-I-S. And check us out online at breakfastpuppies.com slash glitterboys. And also join us on the Breakfast Puppies Network Discord at breakfastpuppies.com slash discord. And if you want to help us out, please spread the word and help us build a community. Thanks again for listening. We'll catch you next time.